For the last few chapters, what we've been focusing on is processes that inform individuals. But in many cases, what we're not dealing with is a single individual. Rather, we're dealing with a network of individuals. And when we are dealing with non-routine informing and networks of individuals, uh, the informing processes often are very, very different and have some interesting and somewhat unusual characteristics. And that will be the focus of Chapter 8. So some of the topics that we'll be looking at in this chapter, uh, we'll start with a look at complex informing processes, how they're different from the sort of straightforward basic model. Uh, we'll then take a look at various diffusion models. This is how information and innovations pass through multiple individual populations. And we'll start by talking about Rogers, who was one of the innovators in this area. And then we'll talk about uh, Watt's small world model, uh, the tipping points of uh, Malcolm Gladwell, and then uh, information cascades. Then we will move on to take a brief overview of power laws, which I think are a very important aspect of complexity. And Finally, we'll talk a little bit about scale-free networks and the notion of how networks self-organize. So how could we determine if an informing situation is simple or complex? Well, two dimensions that I would argue are particularly useful in making that characteristic. And here we're talking about complexity, particularly as it relates to unfamiliarity, are the structure of the model to be communicated. If a model is highly structured, um, it can be completely specified. This is problem space complexity here. And then the sender's knowledge of existing client models. Now notice here, I'm not saying existing client models per se. I'm saying what the sender knows about them. If the sender knows a lot about existing client models, then the sender should be able to tailor the message to something that will be effective for the client. If the sender does not know what the client's uh, internal models are, then you have a significant uh, challenge because if you can't figure out what those models are, there's a very good chance you're going to get stopped by the client's filters. So with this kind of model in mind, we can um, talk about some of the different areas. And when we talk about routine informing, where you have a high knowledge of the client models and a well-defined model that you want to communicate, I would argue the success framework uh, that we talked about, uh, Chip and Dan Heath's framework, uh, is probably going to be pretty effective. Now, when we get to low structure and uh, low knowledge of the client model, we're dealing with low structure informing, in that region we will call our informing processes complex. And in that region there needs to be a tremendous amount of interaction between the client and the informer if informing is going to take place. In fact, very often in this region uh, the client will need to talk more than the informer because it's more important to understand where the client starts from than necessarily it is to start communicating that model. A particularly challenging type of informing occurs when you are trying to inform a large population of individuals. Almost by definition, this is going to move us down into the area where we don't know the client models, because even though we may know some of the client mental models, we're certainly not going to know all of them. And Everett Rogers did a series of studies on uh, diffusion of innovation. And uh, what he came up with was a series of regions. And if we imagine a large population and we imagine time, as a useful innovation is introduced, it tends to go through what is called an S curve, because it looks a little like an S. And each region of the curve uh, tends to be dominated by different individuals. So if we take a look at the beginning of the curve, we have what are known as the innovators. If you've got an innovation, innovators are going to be willing to try it uh, 
pretty much without any evidence because they're intrinsically motivated to try new things. Once the innovators have demonstrated something, what happens is we encounter the early adopters. Uh, they will not adopt something without some evidence of it working, but on the other hand, uh, they do not require a huge amount of evidence or a huge amount of social pressure. Then you have the early majority and the late majority. Uh, this is during the period of the curve where adoption is increasing very, very rapidly. And these individuals tend to be heavily swayed by the social aspects uh, of the uh, adoption, which is to say they don't want to be in a position where everybody else uh, knows this thing and they don't, or everybody else uses this product and they don't. Then you reach the level of the late adopters. These people don't adopt until pretty much everyone is adopted. And finally, you have the laggards up top. These are folks who may never adopt uh, a particular innovation or accept a particular idea. And uh, this curve tends to be pretty robust in most situations where you're trying to inform a large group of people with some new innovative concept. Another informing model that involves uh, large groups of information is, is Watts's small world model. And this is part of an area of theory known as network theory that specifically deals with how knowledge moves through social networks. And the idea of the small world model is that we tend to cluster together with individuals uh, with whom we have close connections. And this is a logical uh, implication of things like culture. And we may be members of multiple small worlds. For example, we may have a small world of individuals that we cluster with at work and another small world of individuals that we cluster with uh, at uh, home and socially. And these clusters, everybody knows practically everybody else. And uh, very often uh, within the cluster, they share a similar set of beliefs, particularly uh, relating to uh, the area that has driving the cluster. So if people are clustering together because of sports, they'll tend to like the same sports, the same sports teams, and so forth. But we also have connections across clusters. These are what are known as weak ties. And uh, the weak ties is how information moves between clusters. And the weak ties turn out to be very, very important, for example, in looking for jobs. There were some studies in the 60s that showed that people tend to do better uh, utilizing weak ties than they do utilizing the strong ties within the cluster. And part of the reason for that is within the cluster, everybody knows everybody else, and so they all tend to know the same thing. When you move out into another cluster, you get a different type of set of knowledge. And um, the implications are that in order for information to diffuse, you need both the strong ties, which produces this homogeneity of information within the group, and the weak ties, which allows information to move between groups as part of the innovation process. Malcolm Gladwell is a science reporter who happens to be very good at synthesizing large quantities of information. And I think his best work was The Tipping Point, which came out in 2000, which really says a great deal about informing. Now, there have been some complaints in some, about some of his recent research that he's done a lot of cherry picking of his findings. But what I've always found is that he does a, a pretty good job of accurately reporting what particular research actually found, but he does not necessarily report all research. But his tipping point basically argued there are four sort of key aspects associated with informing processes in groups. And uh, these aspects involve the law of the few. And the law of the few basically says that when you see informing within a group, there are three types of individuals uh, who are not that common, you know, maybe 5% of the group, 
uh, who have a disproportionate role in the informing processes. And these individuals are connectors, individuals who have a tremendous number of connections with other people. You know, where most of us might have 100 connections, they might have 10,000 connections or something like that. Mavens, these are individuals who basically act as reservoirs of information. They become totally obsessed with gathering as much information as they can on a given subject. And then salesmen slash persuaders, these are individuals who are very, very good at getting other people to accept the information that they're trying to convey. And these three folks working together play a very critical role in the adoption of information, uh, even though they typically represent a relatively small percentage of each population. Uh, the stickiness factor uh, argues that there are certain characteristics of a communication that make it particularly likely to resonate with a client. And, and actually made to stick by Heath and Heath uh, distills a number of those characteristics, and we've already talked about that. Uh, the Power of Context Part 1 basically talks how uh, small aspects of a decision-making setting can exert a huge impact on overall decision-making. Um, and uh, this is, of course, something that is very consistent with the uh, rugged fitness model that we've talked about. And the power of context, too, basically talks about social communities. And they argue that uh, it's a fairly hard and fast rule that social communities work best when they have under 150 participants. And this is somewhat consistent with this notion of strong ties that we talked about uh, in the Watts example previously. When informing takes place within a large group of individuals, uh, what you sometimes see is a phenomenon that's very similar to the punctuated equilibrium that we see in turbulence, which is to say nothing seems to be happening for a long time, and then all of a sudden there is a tremendous rate of change. Uh, we saw that in the S-curve as well. Uh, this is sometimes uh, in the form of what's known as an information cascade. And an information cascade is basically a phenomenon where suddenly information flows like wildfire, right? sort of like criticality in a nuclear reactor. Uh, and uh, one day uh, nobody's doing everything, and the next day everybody is doing it. And there have been some interesting examples of information cascades in history. Uh, one of them that's fairly familiar is uh, the tulip craze in Holland in the 1600s, where uh, eventually the price of a tulip bowl got as high as the uh, price of a house. Um, and uh, this was not the only information cascade uh, that was occurring at that time. In fact, two cascades overlapped there was actually a craze for South Sea seashells at the same time called conchiliomania. Uh, and uh, they described uh, one uh, collector who had uh, 2,389 shells, uh, and he basically used a technique similar to what we use to control nuclear missiles <laughs> to prevent individuals from getting into his shell collection. Here is an example of something that really had very little intrinsic value being associated with a very high estimate of fitness. And as soon as the estimate of fitness you know, came on the number of tulip bulbs you had or the number of conch shells you had, and that became how we estimated fitness, suddenly people started collecting them like mad. And that phenomenon essentially, as I said, is called an information cascade. I have always been fascinated by the concept of fads and information cascades and so forth, and how they interact with the notions of complexity that I've been developing. So back in 2012, I started doing computer simulations that attempted to compare uh, the effectiveness of imitation with the effectiveness of kind of rationally looking at a whole population and what they were doing. So what I did was I constructed uh, 
fitness landscapes using a biological model uh, proposed by Stuart Kaufman. And this model has the unique characteristic of allowing me to tune the complexity. So zero is a completely decomposable landscape, whereas in the case of my landscape, nine was maximally, maximally complex, effectively random. Uh, and then what I looked at was how many steps it took for uh, an entity on that landscape to reach a fitness peak, a local fitness peak. And then what I did is I developed four different types of entities. Uh, the random entity simply wandered randomly until uh, it found that it could not increase its fitness by any further wandering. The expert entity looked at all the other entities on the landscape and using a statistical technique of multiple regression tried to figure out which attributes added to fitness. Um, and then um, the uh, goal-oriented, uh, well, the imitation uh, uh, entity would look at nearby entities, only nearby entities, and you could tune how near they would look, and it tried to mimic fitness uh, by, uh, any time it found a nearby entity with higher fitness, it would uh, try to make itself look more like that other entity. The goal-based entity was similar to the imitation entity. The only difference is the imitation entity would never take a step downward in fitness, whereas the goal uh, uh, based entity would go down in fitness in order to uh, reach a higher level. So if it saw a nearby entity with higher fitness, it would actually go through a valley in order to get to that entity. Now what was interesting is when we start out with uh, the same, uh, with essentially zero complexity, we get very similar results for all three of the non-random choices. The random choice you know, basically the random entity never does that well. Um, but on the other hand, when, um, uh, and, and the expert entity actually did just a little bit better at this point because it could take all the information in the environment. Remember, with zero complexity, complete decomposability, what happens is that, um, you know, if something works in one place, it'll work in another. So if attribute three gives you a positive increase to fitness, it will always give you a positive increase to fitness. So uh, basically it's pretty easy to find uh, fitness at zero complexity. What happens as we approach maximal complexity, however, is the expert gets no better than random guessing because the patterns the expert sees are mainly uh, false or they're illusions rather than being uh, correct. And the imitating entity and the goal-based entity both do a lot better. And what this suggests to me is that there is a, um, a, a certain point of complexity where it actually makes sense to imitate your neighbors. In fact, imitating your neighbors may be the best possible solution that you can come up with or the best possible strategy. And, of course, if imitating your neighbor is the best possible strategy, then you can very reasonably expect to see phenomenon like information cascades occur, because when everyone starts imitating their neighbor, they all tend to adopt the same thing. And this is why you can end up with uh, groups such as cultures forming. Uh, and so uh, this is my contribution to this particular area of research. Before moving on to scale-free networks, what I need to do is introduce the concept of a, a power law. And we've already seen one example of a power law uh, in the form of the learning curve, where essentially you get a straight line uh, if you map the logarithm of frequency uh, against the logarithm of size. Now, Power laws seem to appear all the time when you're dealing with complex phenomena, and in fact, uh, scale-free networks are an example of a power law. But uh, the power law is rarely seen in a pure form. In most cases, the power law looks something like the following curve. And uh, what happens is you have a lot of extremely high frequency events which may have almost any type of distribution up here. Uh, then we get a region where 
essentially you get this straight line relationship that typifies a power law uh, uh, that typically has a lot of the observations in it uh, or I should say a lot if you if you sum the sizes the total value of sizes tend to be dominated within this region and then what happens is the power law falls off as the size uh, of the whatever you're measuring um, exceeds the total available size. Uh, for example, if we were talking about the distribution of cities, obviously there can't be any city that's larger than the population of the world. Well, it turns out that there are lots and lots of phenomena that tend to exhibit a power law, and I'm just going to give some examples first of uh, a power law that I detected and then of some specific other phenomena that tend to be grouped according to this power law distribution. So it turns out that power laws are pretty easy to find if you start looking for them. And what I typically look for if I'm expecting a power law distribution is a phenomena where you would expect a lot of diversity because there's you know a big universe where entities can be located but there is also some tendency of entities to clump together. Uh, and uh, an example of this, I thought, would be citations to literature, because uh, if you take a look at the research literature in different fields, there are lots and lots of articles out there, and we're all competing for people's attention. That would suggest a lot of low-frequency citations. But on the other hand, once an article starts getting cited, or once an article ends up in top journals, then a lot of people see it, and if one person cites it, that's going to encourage other people to cite it, so you will get a, a kind of reaction, the same type of reaction you get, say, in Amazon, when you see that a lot of shoppers are buying this particular product. Uh, and in fact, I took the top management publications, and uh, using Google Scholar, I plotted out the number of citations versus the uh, frequency, and what I basically found is almost a perfect power law in this region where 67% of all citations to management literature took place in a relatively small percentage of the literature, I think less than 5% of the literature, and it almost follows a perfect line. Uh, in terms of this. So this would be an example of a power law citation, uh, power law, and what it suggests is that if you're actually talking about impact, only a very, very small percentage of articles have an extremely disproportionate uh, impact on the literature, whereas there are lots and lots of submissions that really just don't matter that much because people really don't spend any time talking about them. The most familiar form of the power law is the famous 80-20 rule. And power laws like the 80-20 rule tend to be what are known as scale-free. And what that means is that if I look at the 20% portion of the 80-20 rule, I should expect that 80% of whatever the value is is going to be concentrated in the top 20% of the 20%. So the top 4% is going to have 64% of the distribution. If I take that down to the next level, the top 1% is going to have 80% of 64% or about half of the distribution. So the one percenter is going to be about half the distribution. And I can continue going smaller and smaller. That's why uh, it's called scale-free. Uh, so, what are some of the things that have been found to follow power laws? Well, um, as I mentioned in the previous slide, uh, power laws tend to occur where there are forces that would tend to produce very, very di you know, diverse, dispersed distribution, but there are also forces that encourage clustering. So I thought to myself, well, space is very large, but gravity tends to call thing, call, cause things to cluster together, so I might expect uh, phenomena like asteroids being a power law. Well, I looked it up, and sure enough, asteroid size follows a power law. Actually, there are two distinct power laws that have been noticed for asteroid size. Some of the other things that have been mentioned, book sales follow a power law. That's one of the reasons why publishers now are so heavily focused on uh, 
best-selling authors. Um, I suspect movie uh, receipts are similar. Uh, the uh, city size follows a power law. That was where it was first noticed by, I think, Pareto. Uh, company size follows a power law. So there are some very, very big companies, but there are lots more really small ones. Earthquake magnitude follows a power law. Uh, uh, the number of sexual partners follows a power law. Uh, wealth follows power laws. Weblog links follows power laws. Uh, the list just goes on. And uh, one of the things uh, that is significant about that is con complex phenomena tend to be particularly prone to power law distribution. So whenever I see a power law distribution of something, such as citations, I tend to assume that the fitness landscape for getting your work cited is a very rugged one. So why would we expect uh, complex landscapes to generate uh, power law distributions? Well, here is my speculation, or my theory, however you want to call it. Um, the first thing is that uh, complex landscapes necessarily have many peaks. So if you've got a rugged landscape, you're going to have many peaks. That's going to encourage a dis diverse distribution. And the peaks tend to inhibit mass migration. So you know it becomes really hard to migrate. The next thing is that um, complex landscapes lack general rules. That means that you're not going to all optimize to a single peak, uh, and it makes rational solutions to finding fitness very, very difficult to find. By their very nature, uh, the rules tend not to be uh, rational, and, and good general rules of thumb don't exist, so that once again is going to keep things on peaks. But finally, uh, complex landscapes tend to encourage imitation, because imitating self-similar entities is a very effective strategy for improving uh, fitness. And uh, in fact, one of the discoveries of scale-free networks is that when you have networks, such as routers, communicating with the, each other, they tend to naturally evolve to power laws. So I think these three things tend to be part of the reason that almost anything on a highly complex or rugged fitness landscape are going to tend to exhibit power laws. And uh, if you start seeing power laws, that should probably be a pretty good indication that the landscape you're dealing with is not going to be a simple decomposable landscape. So this takes us to scale-free networks, which is a concept uh, developed by uh, Barabasi. And essentially, the idea of a scale-free network is that when a network is allowed to evolve, its connections tend to fall according to a particular pattern. And that pattern basically says that the distribution of connections is a power law, which means that you're going to have some very, very heavily connected nodes and some nodes that are much more lightly connected. Uh, and that's an important fact because allowed to evolve that way, it means that these networks are often quite vulnerable to someone taking out the central node. And because this is an evolutionary system, you know, the notion of a design layer, a construction layer, and, and an informing layer that works well for design systems do not work very well for this type of system. And so that such systems evolve rather than design um, suggests that when we're dealing with complex informing systems, we actually uh, may have to rely a little bit more heavily on evolution than we would necessarily uh, do for a system when we're dealing with more structured knowledge or a much clearer knowledge of where our clients sit. So to wrap up chapter eight, uh, the key point is that complex informing is different from a highly structured informing context where we have a clear idea of what the client knows coming into the process. And if we take a look, the two key variables uh, that determine whether informing is complex or not is the level of knowledge structure and our knowledge of what the client knows and how that information is structured. Uh, 
Informing when we're dealing with a large number of clients is going to depend on a diffusion process. There are lots of different diffusion models. Uh, communities uh, of shared knowledge and imitation can play a major role in the effectiveness of informing across a community. Um, individuals can play a key role as well because certain characteristics, such as the characteristics of the communicator, the maven, uh, the persuader, uh, can have a disproportionate influence on the speed at which information flows through our social networks. Power law distributions are frequently observed when we look at uh, complex systems. And finally, uh, informing systems for complexity tend to evolve rather than being designed from the outset the way other types of informing systems might be.